How's it going, folks? Rob here, and I am joined today by Stephen Reisner uh, from Potent Ponics YouTube channel. G'day, Stephen. How are you? Hey, how's it going? Happy Not to be here. Dead. Thanks for coming along on such short notice. Um, by the way, is it Steve or Stephen? What do you prefer? Steve. Steve? Not a problem. Sweet. Um, so I've been posting a couple of bits and pieces on my channel about dual root zone, and I'm definitely sure I'm not doing it 100% uh, the way it is intended to be done, even though I'm using the term. So I thought I'd invite Steve along today uh, to give us a bit of a, uh, a talk about um, dual root zone and just how they apply to aquaponics, and hopefully the magpies won't chime in too much. Um, so, yeah, uh, first off, Stephen, um, first time I saw you was on the Aquaponics Source uh, YouTube channel, I think it was. That was a few years ago now when I was first learning about aquaponics. So you've definitely had a few years in the industry. Uh, how did you get started out, just quickly? Sure. So I got started in aquaponics originally working in the pet trade. Um, they used to have uh, these aquariums that were kind of half flowing water and half terrestrial for lizards and frogs and things like that. Yeah. They used to call them river tanks. And then we kind of noticed the animals were always a little healthier with the live plants and things like that. So I got really into building these terrariums and things like that. And then um, I got into working with um, different uh, other types of vegetables and other crops. Uh, and then when I moved out to Colorado, I was working in the medicinal plant industry for a bit. And then um, when uh, we had the floods happen there, I ended up getting a job at the aquaponic source when they were looking for a, a new person for product development uh, over there with, with Sylvia. And uh, I worked from them uh, from about 2012, I think it was. Yeah, 2012 until, um, or 2013. Uh, I forget exactly when I started there, uh, all the way till 2015. And then uh, started my own company, Potent Ponics, after uh, um, they no longer wanted to have a cannabis division. So... <laughs> So you've pretty much all gone out on your own doing medicinal plants and that sort of thing. So are you concentrating mainly on research and development or do you actually do physical builds for people as well? Sure. So we do a lot of both. So a lot of what I do is either coming in and helping people that need new standard operating procedures, basically the instruction manual for their farm on pest control yeah. or on nutrient management um, or we'll manage the nutrients for them remotely. Uh, ba based on water tests. Um, and then we'll also set people up with full farm plans on that or design, you know, if they're getting into a specialty crops, you know, we've worked with a lot of different types of crops, fruit trees, many different types of medicinal plants, many different types of root crops that are higher dollar um, stuff for the perfume industry and kind of funkier stuff. Yeah. Um, that's maybe a little bit higher dollar and a little bit better return. Okay. And that's why it's um, um, you know, uh, uh, really cool to see you uh, uh, also working with the different experimentation of the different crops and the different root setups. And um, just like that you've been showing on your channel lately the last couple of weeks, um, you know, how you set the roots up uh, really makes a big difference in how that plant expresses. Uh, you know, some plants will do better with more water, some plants do, do worse, you know, some do much better in the wicking beds like you do with the um, uh, with the, the turmeric and the, uh, the garlic and, and the other things uh, and ginger that you guys that you had. Uh, you had a, a really great ginger video the other day. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so that, that works really well for those types of crops. And then if you're really trying to push things like cucumbers or peppers or tomatoes, I'm um, switching to a full blown dual root zone pot where you have the soil at the top half. Uh, a layer of burlap in the middle uh, and then uh, hydrogen or lava rock in the bottom half and then having that flood and drain just below the soil layer so that it doesn't wick up water you see, although you do have to top water uh, is the one downside to that you do have kind of different moisture control zones so um, if the plant has to have a certain dry back to have certain increase in flavors which happens in certain types of crops um, you can dry back that soil zone it has a little bit of that root stress from that dry back can increase the flavor compounds uh, of certain crops. It also allows you a place that can act like a sponge if you want to dose extra nutrients. So if I'm pushing uh, cucumbers or peppers or tomatoes, I can add a little extra fertilizer to that upper root zone without affecting the fish at all uh, and still keeping the nutrients great for the lettuce that's growing right next to it uh, and still maximize the production of that crop without, you know, affecting the fish or any of the other things in the system. And it allows you to have, you know, five or six different types of crops with different nutrient needs. Um, the other nice benefit to it is, is that you can have, say, if I'm doing things like blueberries or raspberries or something like that, I can actually make a much more acidic soil base 
um, where they can have those associative, uh, uh, associated microbes, like the endophytes and other things that live on the root systems that can help, you know, make the plant, you know, get all the different various things that it needs. In general, the more lignin producing the crop is, the fruit trees and bushes and woodier crops are going to require more of a soil layer. Um, with fruit trees, we'll even do as much as two thirds soil to one third flood and drain, um, whereas most other crops are doing about a straight 50-50. Um, and, and we'll show you that in the diagram. Yeah, I actually had um, one of the comments on the last video um, from Just Give Me The Truth. Uh, he mentioned that he wouldn't mind knowing a little bit more about the growing fruit trees in barrels. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's a, I'll have to do a separate uh, fruit tree video, but um, we actually did a whole presentation of it at the uh, the Aquaponics Association, or I'm sorry, uh, the Aquaponics Source did a, a, present, a whole um, conference at their uh at their shop there the one year and Robbie and I presented on that, uh, on fruit trees. So, um, definitely, uh, uh, something that we did talk about, but, um, what we did is we just put a standard, um, media guard down all the way to the bottom and then did a flood and drain, like you would a hydroponic kit on a timer where it would just flood through the lower hole and hit the overflow and then flow back out. Uh, and then we cut that to be just below the soil layer. And then what we did was when we transplanted the plants in there, we put the media in and then we put the tree in. Uh, that we wanted to put in there that we were transplanting after we got all the old soil off of it. Uh, and then we put that into a clamshell where we cut a two inch pipe piece of pipe that had all the roots in it or a three inch piece of pipe. I don't remember the exact diameter, yeah. um, but allowed us to make like a tube that we can slip the tree in and then put all the soil around it and then slip the pipe out. And then it allowed us to get the depth on the roots and have it all the way down without it, you know, getting broken or smashed or damaged or anything like that. And that worked really well um, as far as setting those up. And I, I can make a little a separate thing for you for that. Yeah. Oh, that'd be cool. Uh, whenever you get the time, I know you're a very, very busy man. Um, yeah. So just, just at the start, I did want to point out to everyone that um, what I'm doing is more a wicking base. Uh, if you're familiar with the, the um, uh, rain gutter grow group, um, Larry Hall, rest in peace, mate. Um, he had a clamshell, uh, clamshell kiddie pool, and he was actually using that to hydrate um, his soil crops. That's more akin of what I'm doing. Uh, the only reason I started calling it dual root zone is because I noticed the roots from the potatoes just went straight down into that sand layer. So they were obviously getting some sort of nutrition and something out of that, that bottom nutrient rich layer, uh, as well as whatever they were getting out of the soil. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, I think what I should be doing is calling mine more a uh, wicking system uh, from now on rather than the dual root zone. So just wanted to say that up front. Um, so yeah, um, did you want to uh, kick it off and we'll have a bit of a gander at um, what you got to show us? Yeah, so we put together a little presentation for you guys to kind of cover this topic a little bit better. And this one covers lots of different types of crops. Um, so you don't have to worry about uh, uh, any type of specialty crops in particular. Um, so uh, uh, in this one, we're going to talk a little bit about um, dual root zone pots and then the different ways that it's set up. I mean, you can see we've got some berries here, uh, elderberries. We have the wonderful tomatoes uh, growing in a dual root zone pot. We got the koi here, so uh, we'll, we'll get right into it. So this is the main setup that we talk about. Um, we really like these basket bottom pots or any other pots that have significantly more holes than normal. Um, we can purchase them here in the States for about the same price with the full basket bottoms. Um, that's not the case everywhere in the world, but uh, you can always add more holes manually if you need to with a drill. You know, it's not really, not really a big deal. And what you want to do is take one piece of burlap, put that across the bottom just to kind of catch the media and make sure you're not spilling it anywhere. And then you're going to go ahead and put in your hydrogen or lava rock or LECA or, or you know, whatever stone it is that you're going to use that's more um, a larger diameter into the bottom of it. And that's going to allow the water to flow in, uh, in through the, the pot. And that's going to be where your aquatic microbes and, and biology is going to be. And you're going to get the majority of your nutrients from the fish waste and uh, the fish water. And that's where you're going to, you know, get most of that from. And then the, uh, you're going to have a layer of, of burlap at the top of that. Now, what I like to do here at the level that I, I want to fill to, oftentimes I'll just take and drill a tiny hole there uh, with a drill um, uh, and put the, the cloth across that so that I know how high to fill it. And then when I'm putting the pots in the beds, I know how deep to put them in the bed so I don't put them too deep and, and actually get the soil wet. And that, and that can help act as a marker. Uh, so once we put our, our burlap on top of the, the media that we have in our pot, then we're going to put our soil layer on top, which is what this is uh, pre-dosed for this pot. And you can kind of see how that works out and how the roots grow out uh, and separate into the different zones. Uh, and then you can see here, uh, so this tomato was grown in a media bed only. 
um, in the lab there at the aquaponic source. And then this one here was grown in that same lab in the next grow bed over uh, in the, um, actually in the same grow bed. Uh, and it was actually, I mean, there's pictures of it later on in the presentation, but you can see here in the dual root zone bed, it had significantly larger roots. Uh, and as you can tell, the more, more roots, more fruits. <laughs> uh, you know, in general. So, and this also has a lot more different species of microbes stimulating the plant because it has that soil zone. And what does that translate into? More secondary metabolite production for your crops. And what does that mean for a vegetable uh, a grower? That means you're going to have a lot more flavor. It's going to have better taste and the plant's going to be more naturally resistant to molds, mildews, insects, and things like that, because it's producing more of those secondary compounds that help repel different, you know, um, pests and problems in the garden. So you're going to get a, a huge benefit simply by having a shallow soil zone. I know a lot, oftentimes people talk about aquaponics being uh, soil free, and I really don't think that that's a good way to describe it. I think that we're just cultivating aquatic soil um, that, you know, if you look at the biology and the minerals uh, in, in it, it functions much more like a living soil system um, with all the biology going on and all the different mineralization processes going on with the fish waste than it does a hydroponic system. You know, it just, yes, there's water and yes, you have grow beds, but that's about the only similarity. So you can see here uh, all the different um, cucumbers in this grow bed. Yep. They're all uh, high enough to where they're not being fully flooded uh, and they're growing quite well. We all, and the other thing you can see here is we put extra hydrogen on top of the pots. And that was just to kind of act as a dry barrier to kind of help prevent fungus gnats. Um, fungus gnats sometimes can, you know, breed in that soil zone. So by having that dry uh, LECA above that, um, you can kind of help mitigate that. And you can see here, they get enormous roots. You can put the dual root zone pots right onto your DWC beds. So if you're already a DWC raft style, um, you can go ahead and do that. I mean, pretty hard to argue with roots like that. I mean, <laughs> it's quite quite gnarly. Um, you also can get all different types of wonderful mushrooms in your garden as well. Um, we oftentimes will inoculate our beds with um, uh, what is called IMO, which is a natural uh, um, uh, fungal collection. But you can also inoculate it with, you know, store-bought mycelium if you wanted to uh, in order to grow mushrooms right in the pots of your, your various crops. So uh, it can add another layer. And remember, those mushrooms are producing secondary metabolites that are going to help prevent things like root rot. And they're going to outcompete things that would be negative fungal infections on your, your plant's roots, right? They're, they're there and, and taking up that real estate that other, other things that would be bad would. So, um, that, you know, it really helps, again, further increase the production of your stuff, especially if we're talking woody crops woody berries uh, and, and, and more woodier stem type type plants. You can see here's a giant cucumber uh, that we grew in a dual root zone pot in a media bed. Yep. Um, another good example. Uh, and then again, uh, another uh, side by side of the, the roots there. Uh, and then some more examples of the, the different uh, the dual root zone pots that we use. Again, um, we're, you're still getting 80 to 90% of the nutrients from the fish water. Um, we're just allowing for either a time release with some minerals uh, with a good soil mix in the upper portion or um, directly supplementing the upper portion. And you can see here, even in just this tiny concrete mixing tray and a tough tote, um, uh, for those in the U.S., just the rubber made tubs that you can get at, at you know, Home Depot. Um, you can make a nice little media bed garden uh, and have dual root zone tomatoes and peppers and all kinds of things in a tiny little two by one grow bed. Just quickly, um, you mentioned you had them in on a floating raft. Have you found uh, there's much of a difference with a media base versus a uh, straight into a DWC? Um, from the soil mix? Sure, so we do get slightly better production out of the flood and drain with the media beds. So if you're doing everything and trying to min max all of your different points, you will have better production with the media beds and it's because you're getting better gas exchange yeah. and you're getting more oxygen to the root system. So it's gonna be able to grow a little bit faster. Okay. Um, but the DWC beds, if you have your oxygen levels high, work almost as well. You're getting a maybe 15% difference in yield, um, not all that much. Yeah. Um, you know, not enough to really rework an entire farm if you already have it set up that way. It's easy enough to convert. Um, but what we do here is uh, just like this as well, um, where we'll put them this way, or what we'll do is we'll cut out three or four big squares or big circles out of the bottom of the pots and leave kind of a cross across the top of it if it's a heavier crop or a more long-term growing crop. Uh, and then go ahead and put the burlap across the bottom, put the pots on, and, uh, and away you go. There you go. Okay, uh, cool. And then here's an example of those dual root zone um, um, barrels with the lemon tree. And you can see here, here's a, uh, 
a regular ammonia test kit you can get in the States and a, a giant cabbage that we were growing. This was part of a, a competition for one of the kids there that was working in aquaponics source at the time. Uh, one of the guys there had a, a daughter and I get a cucumber at the end of the, or I'm sorry, a cabbage at the end of the year and they have to grow it out and then it, bring it back at the beginning of the school year. And um, the next biggest one wasn't even as big as one of the leaves off of the, off of hers. So it was quite comical. And then as far as how much to water, you know, if you're, and we'll go back to the diagram here. If you're trying to figure out how much water you would add to this, right? What you do is take one of these pots and assemble it just as you see here without the plant in it, and then take a measuring cup. So say if I have a, a eight ounce glass of, of water, right? And I know this is, you know, eight ounces or 12 ounces, just slowly pour that into the soil zone until you see it start out to drip. And then that's the actual saturation capacity of that soil. You, you generally don't want to surpass half of that because you're going to get some moisture coming up from the, the bottom portion of the plant. The plant's going to pump some water up you know, from the root system into the soil a little bit as well. So um, it, it will, you know, you don't have to provide hundred percent of it, but what we never want to do is add more than that. So if it was say 32 ounces of water, um, uh, in order to do that, we're going to never add more than 16 ounces, maybe 20 ounces max, um, when we're going to top water the portion of the plant. Right. Um, uh, again, in an ideal world, and this allows you to not overdose it. If you're going to use something that's maybe not fish safe, um, that'll prevent you from having any types of issues. But again, total saturation of the soil, reduce it by half, and that's your desired watering amount. You can go slightly over that and it's no big deal, but that's kind of your target amount. So is there anyone... Um taking this to the next level and use solenoids or anything like that to self-regulate the um, irrigation of the soil? Oh yeah, so we do two different ways to do it. We'll use other drip line setups and we'll feed that off a central manifold with a timer that runs off a, a compressor. The other th the way that we'll do it, actually three different ways. The other way that we'll do it is there's a methodology called um, a blue mats, which are these auto watering um, uh, kind of, uh, it works on a vacuum. So it has a ceramic plug that you put into the soil and it kind of checks how the, based on a vacuum difference of the moisture content around it, it can tell whether or not it needs to water and it has a little uh, a regulator in it that opens and closes. Okay. Uh, so you put that around it with the drippers on it. And then when those, when it gets too dry, it just automatically refreshes the moisture level uh, of that soil. So it maintains really even moisture. They're slightly pricey, but they're really good when you're doing large scale setups. Um, you know, you can pressurize multiple rooms with a single unit, you know, 100 by, you know, 40, 100 by 50 room uh, feet, that is uh, US feet. Um, so uh, it works pretty well and, and again, makes it simple. And the other way that we'll do it is we'll have a bottom watering manifold where the water comes up from the bottom and then overflows over the top. Um, this automatically purges any venturi because if you ever try to run a long uh, multi-valved uh, uh, you know, manifold, you'll know that the first ones will start to suck air and the last ones will start to push a lot more volume of water as that alters the flow. Okay. Um, so this kind of, by having them all top out, prevents that issue from happening because it automatically purges the air all the way, you know, at any point down the line. So yeah. that's the other way that we do it on a large scale. Okay. And you can see here's, here's some of the ones that are similar to like you were talking about with the uh, more of a traditional wicking bed style. And you can do uh, carrots and onions and, you know, garlic and you know, any of your beets, any of your root crops and your media beds that way, it works really well to, you know, kind of make more use of your space with the media beds without having them get deformed. It's not that you can't do a lot of those in media beds, but I'm sure as you've seen in, in your videos, um, that you, it, you just get those pellets embedded in them sometimes and you're, you're cutting them up and you're like, oh man, that's not, not pleasant. Or you bite into it and you're like, oh, that wasn't good. Or you'll get funky shaped carrots that are all That's like scraggly. That's what I was going to say. The carrot, the carrots is one. The the extra peeling for those that peel that uh, was one guy's complaint that there was so many um, dimples he had to you know take off too much. <laughs> um, but actually, just one question I will ask. Um, I have noticed in growing carrots in um, hydroton that there is a load of uh, roots. They get a load of fine roots. Have you noticed in that with the um, soil grown at all using the um, dual root zone? Oh yeah, we definitely have the roots in and out of the water both are much bigger and, and have a lot more of those fine collection hairs yeah. just like you're talking about. Yeah, because um, it's something I've on... never noticed in the soil, but then again, my 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 thinking was the soil grabs onto them, they're banking it, and we're ripping half of them off when we pull them out in the soil. It's also the fact that you have the mycorrhizal fungi and, and the other associative endophytes in the root zones in the soil, and that changes the way 
and the behavior of the root production in the plant itself. So it actually changes how the plant produces roots when those are present. That's why the, the microbes are so important. It's also why we have so many wonderful microbes in aquaponics that we very rarely have a lot of the root issues that a lot of people in soil have, because again, they're, they're just completely outcompeted um, by all the different microbes that are there. It's why we love to add things like lactobacillus or IMO to the systems, because it kind of keeps that diversity as high as possible. And for anyone who's going to ask in the comments what that is, I'll hopefully might talk to Steve in the future more about that sort of um, natural farming techniques in aquaponics as such. Here's an elderberry that uh, that Marty grew. Uh, Marty's a uh, co-host of the, of the, the podcast Hello, that Marty. I do. Yep. <laughs> so this is a wonderful elderberry that he's been growing for a long time there uh, uh, in a dual root zone pot. So you can grow and you can see how woody that thing is over yeah. the you know couple of years worth of growing. So. Again, as long as you kind of hack them back a little bit in the fall, um, you can grow even fruit, you know, tree type type things and you'll do quite well. One question, if I can just jump in talking about sure. um, nitrification. Uh, one, one issue, like I see that a lot of these um, examples you've shown, they're in a media based bed and the pots are dug down to sit within the media. If you mm -hmm. were to use a, say, just a normal tote tray to put the pots in by themselves, just the media in the bottom, free flowing water, flooding and draining, um, is, is there much of an impact nitrification wise? Because obviously we need the, the biofilter capacity of the media in the beds. Have you noticed um, any, any drawback on you can't stock as many fish or do you just naturally design it so there's enough media to act as biomedia within the system? Sure. So we always try to make sure we have a minimum of two or three uh, inches of media at the bottom of the beds just for you know, mineralization purposes. Um, uh, and then beyond that, you can just sit your pots right on top of that and flood and drain them right there without having to fill the beds the rest of the way, especially if you're trying to save money on a commercial build yeah. or um, yeah. just didn't want to spend the extra money. You can totally do that. You just need to make sure that you have your flood, your water level is, is low enough to where you're not getting the sun directly on the water. You don't exactly. want that algae and things like that. So that or put some kind of cover crop like, um, you know, watercress or something that's just going to completely shade that out. And, and kind of prevent that issue entirely. Yeah, not a problem. I just thought I'd ask because I, I was asked with the um, the wicking beds um, if there would be a drawback to just running wicking beds straight off the fish tank after some solids capture, uh, whether there'd be enough surface area and biofiltration just running through a um, constant flow wicking bed. But I suppose that's a different subject altogether. Oh, yeah. So if you're going to do a constant flow wicking bed, you would just want to make sure that you had a good you know, probably two to four inch layer at the bottom, you know, I, I don't remember what that is in centimeters, but okay, 50 to 100 go. mils. So. Okay, 50 to 100 mils. Um, so you want to do a, a shallow layer of that with a very porous media, and I would probably go with a large diameter to make sure it's flowing through there quite well. Yeah. Um, the other thing that you might even want to go ahead and do is take a couple pieces of pipe and go from one end to the other, drill them full of holes and allow an extra bypass to where that water can always you know, flew, yep. uh, freely flow through that. Yeah. Yeah, my, my take on it was because I have the uh, the PEO3 um, biomedia is I just run everything through a biofilter before it actually entered into the wicking beds myself. But I know a lot of people don't have access to that. I'll stop interrupting. Go for it, mate. Oh, no worries. I, uh, so we have here again uh, another picture later on of the elderberry, even larger. And then you can see here we have some grapes going. Again, um, you can grow any type of crop, flowering crop or anything like that. Uh, um, uh, in your aquaponics, you know, there really isn't a limit. It's just a matter of dialing in the root system so that you have it. Another thing that we had and had good luck with once we inoculated it properly was OSHA root. Wild OSHA root's a good antiviral and it's, it's well known for being a strong antiviral. And all we had to do was inoculate it with a little bit of the uh, soil from where we had found wild OSHA. Uh, and we were able to get whatever that microbe was that it needed, uh, be it a fungi or a bacteria and get that inoculated into the wicking beds. And that worked extremely well for, um, uh, uh, getting those plants to grow that are normally considered, you know, extremely difficult. You can see here, this is those tomatoes that we were growing in side by sides. So the media bed one had 42 per, or 44% more flower sites and 38% more tomatoes um, and was ready two weeks before, had the first harvestable tomato two weeks before the non-dual root zone tomato. And you're putting that down to um, mainly the nutrient within the soil itself? 
Well, there's a small amount of nutrients in there, but it's also the microbial diversity. You have different microbes that are able to break down minerals in a different way in the in the soil system than you do in the water. You know, different different species, and the plant can kind of pick and choose which minerals and which microbes from the minerals that it wants. It kind of you know increases its diversity. It also increases the secondary metabolite production, which just makes the plants healthy, more able to do production. And then again, here's some more photos of the following up with the tomatoes there. You can see here as well, um, by having the extra soil zone, we get more anthocyanin production as well on the purple crops and things like that. So if color is another one of the aspects that you're, you're pushing for, that flavonoid production like anthocyanin in this case um, uh, with the purple tomatoes is, is really increased by having those microbes from the soil zone as well. There's all Steve's um, different links and whatnot, and they'll also be listed down in the um, description of the video below. So if you want to um, check that out. Um, now, I was hoping to get a couple of questions through from other people uh, to sure. ask you, um, but unfortunately, um, didn't really have enough time to do so. But I do <laughs> have a couple that I jotted down myself, mate. Uh, one, sure. one we've pretty much all already covered, and that's the nitrate removal of soil, because that's, that, that tends to be the biggest question. How, how are we getting the, um, the, nit uh, the ammonia removed, sure. converted through to nitrate, and then ultimately sure. out of the system? So you... you just to jump back on that a bit, um, you were saying that the bulk of the nutrients are still aquaponically available. So you're basically saying that that soil is there um, not only to add different microbes and microflora um, biota into the mix, but it's also somewhere to deliver components that may be harmful to the fish or the system in general. So you, you still, are, if you are looking at your root zone, folks, you are still basically running aquaponics it's just there's a little bit of a, an, an ability to amend with other um, biota and elements. Did that make Absolutely. sense? Absolutely, and yep. even, <laughs> even, with, even with the wicking beds too, I mean, you, those roots are still gonna grow down through that soil and suck that nitrogen in and, and pull that water in and draft up more. Uh, and then once they get all the way down to the water, they're going to start to absorb nitrogen directly from the water anyway. So, yeah. you know, those roots will still go all the way down there. So you'll see the plant biomass, you know, the same amount of plant biomass is going to use the same amount of nitrates, whether it's in a wicking bed or in a DWC, you know. So, you know, as long as you have enough biomass to absorb that amount of nitrogen that you're putting out, you know, you're fine. Yeah, well, that's one thing I've um, noticed just in basic um wicking beds, the, the amount I've pulled down and moved around the place here, every single one of them, no matter what crop I grew, whether it was greens, herbs, tomatoes, capsicums, trees, all of them had roots down in that sand layer. They were always roots down there. So they will make it down there. But that that is a concern that a lot of people have said, well, they're just getting it from the soil. I've seen on forums and social media. People also worry about it, you know, saying that it can introduce pathogens and things like that. We've not had that issue at all. And we do with the medicinal crops that I grow, we have to test all of that stuff for every 10 pounds of production. We have microbial testing uh, of plant material. So um, we would have seen it by now if it was a problem. I'll tell you that because we meticulously test everything we have to by law. Yeah. And the, and the other, actually, the other point on that was um, someone pointed out with mine being outside, the amount of rain we've had, especially so far this year, um, is the water getting muddy from it? Uh, it's not. The pouch is basically filtering it out. But I don't really think it matters if the soil, get, uh, the water gets too muddy because you should see the river these fish live in naturally. Um, the river is mud. It, it's basically what it is. You can't see the fish in the water. Um, so that they are used to um, some small suspended solids. Uh, so it's not going to be a great issue. And most, most potting mixes and compost I use anyway uh, are very organic based. So there's a lot of organic material in there, a lot of sand and things like that. So it's not really an issue. There's not silty mud flowing through. The, the one thing I would say to, for people to be care, careful of is be sure that there's no yucca extract or added saponins. Uh, into your mix because those will kill fish in extremely low levels like even one pot in a big system could kill all your fish okay. um, if and that is often used in organic soil mixes and it is something that you do have to look out for i don't know if it's as common in the in australia but i know in the united states i would say about you know 40 percent of the stuff on the market has it in it okay i'm, I'm not aware of it and yeah, until now so it was definitely something i'll have a look at in, into I, I pretty much will just use the the basic uh, premium blend uh, that's made fairly locally to here and just toss in a handful of whatever organic I've got going around, castings or compost. 
the one thing I was going to talk about was um, the labs and the natural farming, but I think really the more I look into it, that, that's, that's a whole different kettle of, you know, like that's, yeah, that you can go on for hours about that sort of stuff. Um, basically, your, your favourite go-to um, natural farmer, Chris, is someone you'd recommend people look into, uh, his stuff on YouTube, or is there any sites you'd recommend? Oh, yeah. So if you want to get into the Korean natural farming portion, um, Chris Trump has a wonderful online course as well. So if you're anywhere and you can't take one of his in-person classes, you can go ahead and take that. And he's added a ton of extra content to that since he's launched it. Um, and uh, it is a really, really good course if you're wanting to, to do that. And it's ChrisTrump.com. Real easy. Links uh, down below. Can't, can't yep. really forget it. Yep. Not so. a problem. And uh, one last one was, what's your favorite way to grow? Obviously, um, dual root zones pretty much all it now or do you still have a fondness for dwc and, and media beds for some crops so i would just say you got to grow match your your grow method to your crops so dwc for um for leafy greens and then you're going to have media beds for things you're going to grow more than two or three months yep. uh and, and, you know the leafy greens are going to be for anything quick turn uh, and then you know dual root zones for anything you're going to grow the long term that's flowering um, and then uh, even some wicking beds to grow root crops. You know, I think that, again, it just depends on how much I wanted to grow of each type of crop uh, on a regular basis. And then a lot of times what we'll do too is for people when we plumb their systems initially commercially, we'll, change, we'll put the plumbing in at the end where we can run them as wicking beds with a low flood layer, or we can run them as media beds and flood and drain, or we can run them as DWC because it has all three of the, the setups at the very end of the grow bed. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll do long runs and then we'll do loop siphons that because we can do loop siphons with, you know, hundred foot runs or whatever. And it's not as big of an issue as it is with a, a bell siphon or, you know, any of the other ones. With that, is there any, any tech that you'd recommend people look into like testing or any, any gear like that? I haven't seen you mention a lot of it online. Uh, is there any um, tech or services you would recommend for sure, folks so, who want to uh, get, um, put a, a fair bit of money and investment into their system uh, if you're, <laughs> for the larger systems or maybe a semi-commercial? Sure. So if you're if you're doing testing, um, you can check out AP. Uh, I'm sorry. Sorry about the cat. Uh, AP test. All my creatures decided they wanted to interrupt the, the, the stream today. Um, uh, APTestKit.com. I put together a free spreadsheet for anyone that wants to download it. Uh, it has all the different personal test kits for people at home. Um, and then they can also check out True Aquaponics if they want to go ahead and um, do their own test or have us test your water for you. We do offer a commercial service where we'll test your water and send you a, a pre-measured packets to rebalance your nutrients uh, on that. Um, but if people just want to check it out themselves at home, you can just check out AP, uh, uh, aptestkit.com. Uh, and it will have uh, all your various test kits so that you can buy the different ones. Some advice for people that do want to test their, their various things. If you're going to do it uh, and you want to send out your own samples, um, J.R. Peters and MMI Labs are kind of the two main people that people use in the United States. Uh, the other one would be Logan Labs. Uh, those three are probably 80% of the tests that are done in the U.S. as far as water quality and soil quality. Um, but if you're going to um, test your own stuff at home, HANA, H-A-N-N-A-H, makes really nice test kits, and Lamote. Those are kind of the two companies I'd recommend you get uh, invest in if you're going to buy the equipment from them. HANA is really nice, especially if you have color blindness. A lot of people, you know, about, uh, was it 15% of people plus minus have, have color blindness uh, to some degree. So uh, if you're having issues with that, you don't have to compare the color charts to the test tube and all that. It just gives you a digital number. You know, you put the little vial in after you mix it up and it says, hey, it's 29.7 parts per million or whatever. Um, they have a wonderful iron test kit, especially that's really good as long as you don't use uh, EDHA. Um, if as long as you're using DTPA iron, uh, it will give you accurate readings. But if you use any of the other irons, it will give you false, falsely high iron because of the coloring of it and how it works. But um, uh, those are the ones that I would recommend to people, uh, especially again, if you have color blindness or you just um, maybe for schools and, and teachers and things like that as well, the digital readouts from the HANA units are a little bit easier for the students. Not a problem. Well, thank you very much for that, mate. Really appreciate the pointers. Um, but I, th I think we might pretty much all leave it there, let you um, go to bed, because I know it's probably getting a little bit late over there. So, um, yeah, thank you very much, Stephen. I really do appreciate this um, coming on to help us all and educate us a bit on dual root zone. And... Um, we shall catch you down the line talking about natural farming, maybe as it pertains to um, aquaponics. Yeah, we should totally do a, a natural farming video and talk about labs and IMO and, and all yeah. that, because I feel like it's kind of a new direction that 
Um, I got introduced, Chris Trump actually originally got started in aquaponics. A lot of people don't know that before he did KNF at all, he was an aquaponics guy. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, uh, he ended up kind of discovering KNF, but we started, you know, I started talking to him when I was doing a conference and started adding it to the aquaponics and really realizing how really a, of a change it can add and, and especially improving food quality and uh, food safety. It really makes a huge difference in, in, the, in the crops. Even pest and disease control. Oh yeah, and, you know ways to make your own pesticides and things like that, and mold yeah. controls without having to rely on the store. Especially with uh, uh, everyone rely, moving more towards self sufficiency, it can certainly add uh, new weapons to your your arsenal against the uh, the pests in the garden. Yeah. Anyway, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much once more, mate. And um, yeah, we'll see you around. Thanks see a lot. Time. Thanks for having me. Thanks again to Steve for coming along and educating us about dual root zone aquaponic growing methods. There will be all the links to not only his websites, but also Chris's down below if you want to learn a little bit about natural farming. And fingers crossed we'll be able to get Steve back soon and have a bit of a chat about using natural farming techniques in aquaponics. Uh, or there's also a link to his potent ponic YouTube channel down there. They do fairly regular podcasts on that channel. So suss it out, especially if you're into medicinal herb growing over there in the US, you might pick up a couple of tricks here or there. A quick plug for my own guide before we go though, back at Aquaponics for Beginners, there will be a link down below and one will pop up here. It's an online interactive guide and downloads are slowly being added so you can learn offline uh, for you folks who have dodgy internet. Apparently there's more out there with our dodgy internet than I first thought. So um, I do hope those downloads help you folks who've already purchased the guide and had a bit of a gander at them. Before I go, thank you very much to everyone who comes along. Don't forget to thumb it up, leave your comments down below and share it around the different social networks if you think it'll help your friends and family out. Thank you as well to all those folks supporting us on the various different websites. Really do appreciate it. I'll stop rambling on. I do hope you're all well and happy and your own aquaponics and gardens are booming and I will catch you next video. Cheers folks and happy growing.